Welcome to The Bid, where we break down what's happening in the markets and explore the forces changing the economy and finance. I'm your host, Alex Craddock, Global Chief Marketing Officer at BlackRock. The rise of the internet and social media has heralded in a new age of information, but also of misinformation. In today's highly competitive market, building and maintaining brand trust is essential for the long term and can make or break a company's reputation and bottom line. So how can businesses and brands protect their reputations, and how much does it matter to investors? Here to help us look to the future of brand trust, I am really pleased to welcome Lex Suvanto, CEO of Edelman Smithfield, a specialized financial communications boutique within the global PR firm Edelman. Lex brings two decades of experience in PR with a focus on formulating compelling messaging to win support from investors and key stakeholders. Lex, welcome to the bid. Thank you, Alex. It's great to have you here, Lex. So look, to start, it would be really great to understand how do you define and measure trust? Why don't I provide a little background on the trust barometer? So we've studied trust for uh, 20 years at this point. The latest survey, 28 countries surveying 30, 32,000 people. It's safe to say it's the defining research on the topic of trust and reputation. If you think about it, trust is a forward-looking metric a projection into the future, a willingness to accept uncertainty. People only invest uh, if they believe in the future. So after two decades of researching trust, we break it down into four dimensions. Ability, dependability, integrity, and purpose. Trust defines an organization's license to operate. Every year we conduct the research and we find important and provocative insights about people, about the world, for example, in recent years, it's become clear that trust has gone from being top-down to being conveyed locally, peer-to-peer. -peer. Interestingly, people around the world view a coworker, someone like you, people like us, as more credible than a CEO, more trustworthy than a politician. Wow, thanks, Lex. So look, it sounds like you're measuring the ultimate currency in a relationship. You just wrapped up your latest trust barometer and what has been a turbulent start to an economic year. What are some of the key trends that you are seeing? And are there any emerging trends that are important for us all to be aware of? A really important takeaway that's useful and important for the audience to understand. Um, in this recent years, a major insight is that business is now the only trusted institution. The business sector has a lead of more than 10 points versus government and media. On the other hand, governments are seen as a source of false and misleading information by almost half of respondents around the world. Compare that, though, to my employer's newsletter, the newsletter that we get inside of our companies. That's considered by people around the world as the most trusted source of information. More broadly, more than half of people around the world say their countries are more divided today. Economic optimism has decreased. In 24 of 28 countries, we're seeing all-time lows in economic optimism. Personal anxieties are increasing. Fear of job loss, inflation, climate change, nuclear war. And there's also a mass class divide. People in the top quartile of income brackets are more trusting than people in lower incomes. So it's no surprise that respondents report that social fabric has weakened amid this division. We also found that a person's ideology has become their identity. Here's an interesting view of that. Only 30% of people say they would help a person in need if they strongly disagree with their point of view. Only 20% of people say they would work with somebody who has a strong, different point of view. In this environment, survey respondents say they want the business sector to do more, regardless of political affiliation. More than half want to see business doing more, collaborating more, to address societal issues such as climate change, economic equality, health care. But at the same time, business can appear politicized when addressing these societal issues. So it sounds like there's been a lot of change over the last few years and, and obviously in the last year with, with trust. I'm starting to see an emerging theme here, which is exciting. Um, so let's go a little deeper. What are you seeing in the latest trust barometer findings that are specific to the financial services industry? 
So low levels of trust clearly played a role in the recent banking crisis. Just this week in banking earnings, we saw one of the biggest regional banks lose $100 billion in deposits. We saw UBS gaining billions in deposits. Clearly, there's a difference of trust playing out right before our eyes. In the research, over several years, financial services is among the least trusted sectors, second only to social media. That was an outcome of the Great Recession. It has gotten better over the last few years, but only 38% say financial firms serve the interests of everyone equally and fairly. Central banks at the center of the recent crisis are not trusted in four of the five global financial markets. But here's an interesting fact, again, back to my employer. Employees working inside of financial services companies trust their own employer more than in any other in the industrial sector that we survey. This means that we've got brand ambassadors. Anyone working inside of a financial services firm, we've got brand ambassadors that are ready to speak out on our behalf. That's awesome. So look, you just referred to the difficult and challenging start we've had to the year. Um, global economy has been under stress, the financial industry in particular with the collapse of several regional banks in the US and the acquisition of Credit Suisse by UBS has really had a tough start to the year. In all cases, these fractures across the financial services industry happened fast and the shocks have rippled around the world, causing a huge amount of market volatility and stress. What are the implications of these recent events on trust in the financial services industry? So a lot's happened in the last couple of months. We actually went back into the field in April. The earlier research I was citing was from a few months ago, but given the significance of the recent cycle, we went back into the field in April to measure any differences. No surprise that in April, the research showed an increase in economic anxiety for people, which then translated into concerns about the health of their own bank, a majority of people are concerned that the recent disruptions will impact their own bank. 22%, small but meaningful, say that they would look for an alternative bank to place their deposits. That's meaningful. Um, there have been notable declines in two areas that are worth uh, mentioning. There was a drop in people saying that financial services has a vision for the future that they can believe in. So fewer people saying that financial services has a vision that they can believe in. There was also a drop in people saying that financial services serves the interests of everyone equally and fairly, a drop in number of people that say that. But I refer back to Larry Fink's annual letter, and I quote, long-term investing requires trust in the financial, services, financial system and a fundamental belief that tomorrow will be better than today. We need leaders today who will give people reason to be hopeful, who can articulate a vision for a brighter future. <laughs> Unfortunately, given after the recent cycle, the numbers are going in the opposite direction. So that's an opportunity for all of us to think about. Also, the regional banking crisis highlighted the role of social media. Through the crisis in Silicon Valley Bank, there were thousands of tweets saying, run on the bank with pictures of pe people lining up at the bank doors. Clearly, this added to the chaos and panic. Um, the crisis was then compounded by people having access to their deposits, being able to move their money at the push of a button. So that creates a new risk that anyone in this uh, sector needs to think about, a new risk for banking institutions. And one could easily argue that main maintaining trust with consumers is getting even more important, the relationship, mm. the communications, the marketing, given the fact that people can change their financial, uh, their financial provider and partner with the push of a button. So talking about new risks and having seen how social media has disrupted trust, especially in the last few months, I can't help but think about the potential disruption from artificial intelligence. We're all talking about it. Would love to hear your thoughts around AI and its implications for trust. So many may have read, CEOs of large technology companies are referring to AI as terrifying. One CEO that's very prominent referred to AI as potentially leading to civilization destruction. So the question of trust is a prominent part of the AI discourse happening right now. The issue is that none of us really understand AI, and there's a rising concern about accuracy and bias. Even the CEO of Google recently pointed to hallucinations observed in the output of AI systems. 
Lack of transparency is a big part of that. Recent research found that 72% of people say that knowing a company's AI policies is important before making a buying decision. So here's the question. Do you understand your firm's AI policies? More than half of millennials and Gen Z say they will consider switching brands if data policies, including AI, are not clear. So brands and companies need to demonstrate responsible use of, of AI. Companies will need to be prepared to explain decisions made by those systems. We've all read that AI increases the potential for, bi for bias depending on who created the algorithm. One hurdle is that there's no agreed upon definition of fairness. So the problem is there's no universally accepted fairness definition that can be programmed into AI. It begs the question, whose values do we use in AI? Then there's the question of accountability. If an AI system is wrong, who's accountable? When you call a customer service hotline, you can ask to speak to the manager. But if an AI system gives you an answer you don't like, who do you ask? What manager do you speak to? Ultimately, AI systems will need to be able to explain, the system itself will need to be able to explain why it's giving you the answer that it's giving. Businesses will need to produce AI responsibility reports, just like ESG reports. In the recent research we conducted in April, we asked consumers how they feel about AI and financial services products. We were encouraged to learn that two in five Americans believe AI will improve financial services. Some say it already is. It already has started to improve these systems, so that's a good start. Our job as professionals and leaders in this sector is to maintain and build on that trust. That will require building principles, fostering transparency, and helping people know how to use AI uh, and the technology ourselves. That's really interesting. I think it's, it's great to hear that the sort of the ongoing theme for us all is this need for greater transparency and really helping our customers understand how AI is helping them and how we're using the data to help That's them. Right. So it sounds like there's a, there's, a, there's a potential opportunity there, which is great. Um, so look, moving on to, I think, one of, one of the more exciting trends around the world um, that we're seeing in investment management is the rapid emergence of a new generation of younger investor. Think young millennials, older Gen Z, sort of under the age of 35. Um, could you tell me about the key characteristics of this generation in terms of building trust, and how should they be treated differently than other generations? So the Gen Z, Gen Z generation is already one of the largest segments in the US. Between millennials and Gen Z, it may very well be the largest already. Definitely poised to reshape consumer, economic, and political trends. But a major finding, and this cuts through all aspects of marketing to this generation, a major finding is the emergence of what we call belief-driven buying. Nearly two out of three consumers today buy or advocate for brands based on their values. Gen Z is leading that trend. Here's some characteristics about Gen Z. Gen Z consumers feel the need to take action and fight for their future, given the issues that they see in the decades ahead. They unite around causes such as sustainability, educational access, equality, mental health. This influences where they shop, where they buy, who they will vote for. Um, they live and build relationships through technology. They control information throw, flow through social media. As a result of all of this, Gen Z is turning corporate marketing upside down. Nine in 10 Gen Zers want the brands and services they buy to get involved in causes that they care about. They have a strong belief in the influence of experts and believe in influencers. They buy on their beliefs and want to work with brands that stand with them on the issues that they care about. I was recently teaching a class to a group of Gen Zers from all around the country. One student from the Southwest said, when I see a brand that's getting involved in global and societal issues, it gives me hope. It gives me hope. I share that anecdote because that statement isn't about politics. That statement is more about their view of the viability, their view of the health of the future. So to build trust with Gen Z, corporate leaders need to ask themselves a few simple questions. Are your products and services tailored to Gen Z? What do your products stand for? 
And are your technologies and social media meeting the expectations of Gen Z and how they use it? So there's a few things that we're going to have to think about as we want to engage this younger audience of investors and how we build trust with them. Um, but I think it's such an exciting opportunity for our industry. You've shared a lot of great insight about trust from the latest Trust Barometer study. Bringing all of these things together, what are the two or three key insights that investors should take away? And what should they do differently to build trust with our customers based on your insights? Absolutely. I can offer a few high-level takeaways and then a few tactical takeaways. So the first one is business needs to, business as the most trusted institution needs to work on helping to break the current cycle of anxiety and division and polarization in our world. As the most trusted institution, the business sector must help restore economic optimism. Businesses must help temper polarization by investing in fair compensation, training, focusing on local communities to address the mass class divide. Businesses and government must work together to build consensus and collaboration on policies and standards. And businesses must help advocate for the truth, to be a reliable source of information, to promote fair discourse. A few tactical considerations. In this fast-paced environment, just on the heels of the regional banking crisis, it's clear that it's important to over-communicate. Make information easy for stakeholders to understand and access, Establish what we would call push channels. Be prepared with communications tools that reach your audiences where they are quickly and easily. And action pack your narrative. What we mean by that is emphasize the actions you're taking to stabilize your company, to strengthen your position, even to stabilize the environment and the industry. And lastly, don't underestimate the importance, the growing role of the Gen Z generation if you can build trust and advocacy among Gen Z, they will become fierce advocates for your products and your brands. Sounds like a, a, great, set of, uh, a great set of takeaways for us all. And um, I think within that, a lot of opportunity for us. So look, Lex, thank you so much. Um, as always, I mean, I love the Trust Barometer. It's just a massive sort of great, great, great insight for us. We are in a time of change. There's a lot of market stress. But I always sort of look back over history and go, look, you know, in these times of change and these times of stress, actually, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and I think, you know, what you've given me and hopefully everybody here is a lot of hope that there's a lot that we can actually do to build trust, especially with this new generation of younger investor that's embracing a highly digitized way of engaging with us. We need to think differently. We need to think differently and approach the experience differently. Um, but I think ultimately, we're going to get the best reward of all, which is the trust of our customers and our clients. So Lex, thank you very much for joining me today on The Bid. I appreciate it and um, speak to you very soon. Thanks, Alex.